right hey folks so we are in for the final part of the january q so let's get into it first question by nathan he says favorite hypertrophy exercises per body part it's a good question it's a fun question i don't often place a lot of importance on specific exercises my stance on exercises is you're going to do most of them over the course of a lifetime anyway whereas for me the discussion around the more top-down factors of exercise execution volume intensity these are more interesting more meaty but it's a good question so let's go on with it we will start from the bottom and we'll go to the calves okay calves my personal favorites is standing variations not a big fan of seated ones i don't get much from to be honest i'm not also a fan of donkey style calf raises either so just regular standing calf raises or on a leg press they tend to work the best now for hamstrings i'm a much bigger fan of leg curls i found over a lifetime when i do hip hinge movements i tend to get a lot more lower back and glute so hamstrings i like to isolate them whether they're seated or they're lying doesn't bother me and to be honest that recent study about lying leg curls which people are still very hung up on which was later refuted shows there's no real preference either lying or seated whatever either's fine now the quads big muscle group i would say for me what built my quads the most was medium to close stance regular squats and hack squats leg presses are great don't get me wrong but for me what caused the most growth was squats i don't know my quads feel more trashed after a good leg press session but i've always gotten more growth from squats my favorites have been the regular barbell high bar squat obviously i was a power lifter and i remember when i transitioned from doing low bar wide stance to high bar medium stance for competition my quads completely changed shape they were fuller down at the knee so the teardrop muscle really grew a lot so that's a big one for me i think in terms of feel probably pendulum squats are my favorite quad exercise because they feel great I can still do those nice and heavy. I pause at the bottom. I don't pause, whatever. They always feel good. Okay, so for abs, I would say the premier exercise is a cable crunch. That's the big one for me. The cable crunch, if done correctly with spinal flexion, is the best ab exercise there is out there, period. No argument. As long as you execute it correctly. You have to execute it with spinal flexion. You can't just bend at the hip. I did a video about this. If you search on my channel for cable crunch in terms of lower back and glutes i would say the stiff leg deadlift without a doubt the best exercise of all of them if we go on to chest the best chest builder for me was the bench press i <laughs> gotta put it out there as much as people hate on the bench press say it's a strength movement and blah 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 i got a bigger bench my chest got bigger I, my whole upper body got bigger quite literally the bigger my bench cut the bigger my upper body got in terms of other things that i like right now i use a nautilus chest press machine which is great it has a neutral grip it's wonderful feels great on the shoulders i'll tell you one more weighted dip when i first started doing weighted dips many years ago it was the only thing that built my upper chest sounds contradictory because people always say the weighted dip is for the outer chest and the lower chest but actually for me the weighted dip was the only thing that built my upper pecs in those early days. To go to the upper back, I got probably the most growth from chins. In terms of rowing exercises, yeah, fine, they're fine. I always had to go a lot stricter with rowing exercises. Cheat rows gave me absolutely nothing. I just think it's cope. It's just a way for a little guy to use a lot of weight, and I think he's doing well for himself, but pointless, really. Oh. The amount of energy you expend doing something like that you could be better served putting into some proper sets and reps if we go on to shoulders i would say what's built the most muscle for me has been side laterals and various side lateral variations i made a video about this because i also know that some people get better results with overhead pressing but at the same time i also know some people are just emotionally attached to overhead pressing it's the whole macho thing which is very prevalent in today's um modern fitness realm you're not a man if you don't overhead press kind of vibe but uh, yeah in terms of cold hard effectiveness it's been side lateral variations have done the most for me if we go to arms more cable type of work has worked the best for arms so 
behind the back variations like a Bayesian curl those have been tremendous for my bicep growth and uh, things like preacher curls regular barbell curls are pretty good really anything where I can feel the the movement so biceps very much like side delts have always responded to lighter work weaknesses in my delts my biceps were fixed by lighter cable movements and side laterals so I speak from experience and the triceps was always heavy work so I've pushed back against this idea of overhead work for long headed with triceps a lot in the past and I still push back on it now because it doesn't reflect my experience my best tricep results came from heavy close grip benches heavy weighted dips heavy benches as well yeah because if you think about it the long head of the tricep is the largest head. So anytime you extend the arm, your long head is getting activated because it's the biggest muscle there. If you extend your arm, you are predominantly using the long head. It, you can't help but use it, especially if you're going heavy. It will recruit all the long head. So the special emphasis on overhead work didn't do anything for me at all. I got very strong with pressing movements and that built massive triceps. Let's move on. Okay, so we're going to go to low end frequency 1007. He says, we'll do low lateral raises provide any positive carryover to my overhead pressing or is it purely valuable as a bodybuilding movement? I think here we enter into a long discussion about carryover. This concept of carryover is very misunderstood because how do you measure it? How do you actually measure what is giving you carryover? Because assuming you're still overhead pressing and then you add loo lateral raises on top, well, how do you know it's the loo lateral raises which is giving you progression and not just your continued training of the overhead press? You don't know, you can't tell. So you can't tell whether they're providing positive carryover. You can't tell whether they're not. It's the same with bench pressing and adding in close grip bench pressing. Unless you actually completely exclude the bench pressing movement heavy, you don't know what's giving you carryover. So people say, do the overhead press for bench press carryover? Maybe. But I think it's a very muddled area. How are you going to measure? what's giving you carryover. And most people who think they're getting carryover, they can't give you a precise answer on that. How do you do it? If you take away an exercise you're trying to improve, that's an added factor. It's, you cannot separate this out. You don't know. So whoever claims to know completely whether a movement has carryover or not, it's highly unlikely they've conducted such an experiment where everything's been completely equal. And there'll always be somebody who will be in the comments saying, look, I'm sure I did. And belief is a very good thing. If you believe you did, then great, fantastic. But after a long career of powerlifting and trying to improve things and looking at the, the effects of carryover, the biggest carryover is, tends to be the movements which are highly correlated to the actual lift. So for the bench press, the close grip bench or the feet up bench press, those are the big ones that I used. For the squat, it was a high bar squat or poor squat or beltless squat. For the deadlift, it was stiff leg deadlifts. But in terms of additional movements which are going to give you carryover, it's very difficult to say. I would err on the side of no. Okay, so we will go with Nuno lifting. He says, let's say an individual gets consistently sore on the hamstrings with even two sets a session. Would it be wise to assume that means two sets is enough to grow? Or should one consider switching exercises to allow for more volume and less fatigue? I think this question betrays a lack of focus on what actually matters. The bottom line for how you know you're progressing on anything is performance increases. It's not soreness. Soreness is a useful metric to show whether you're targeting the muscle or not. It also shows sometimes whether the novelty effect is in place. This is why people get sore when they train a muscle group once a week. That's enough time to have elapsed for some detraining to occur. So I think you're, you're focused perhaps on the wrong metric. The metric to focus on is poundage improvements. That is the only thing that matters. If all else remains the same, then if you are getting stronger, you are demonstrating your muscles are bigger because they are able to produce force for longer or produce more force. That soreness wouldn't be a metric which I would use to change volume independent of performance increases. I think that is unnecessary micromanaging of the routine and it betrays a lack of focus on what's important. I'm surprised that I got that many upvotes as a question which people are interested in because we know that poundage progression is the bottom line. Okay. 
Next question from Quibase. He says, any suggestion on how to progress on horizontal pr presses in the context of hypertrophy training? Don't know why, but for me, they seem a lot more stubborn compared to all of the movement patterns. So there's two things going on here. Okay, so the first thing is, it's very common that people need more work for pressing than for other areas. When I was coming up and I was trying to move my bench press from 200 pounds to 300 pounds, I needed a lot of pressing volume. I was doing something like, I think 25 sets of pressing per week to finally get my bench press moving. That's the first thing. Your pressing muscles just might need more volume. The second thing is less obvious and it's less talked about. Most people will pr put more attention towards the bench press than other lifts. They're more consistent with it. They put more effort towards it. They do more volume towards it. And so they will stall on that lift quicker. You will perceive that lift or any horizontal pressing is stalling first when the reality is it's just more trained than everything else. It's hard to squat and deadlift with the same level of focus you put into benching. Benching is a breeze. You are literally exercising while lying down. It doesn't get better than that, does it? You're literally lying down on a nice, comfortable padded bench, training the beach muscles. Squatting and deadlifting, on the other hand, it's just emotionally more taxing if you're doing it right. So people put a lot more emphasis on benching and as a result, they stall out on it quicker. Okay, S. Lee says, is it worth 40 year olds to do a bulk from a health perspective? Yeah, it can be. It certainly can be. I think if you haven't gained the majority of your muscle, it certainly can be. I wouldn't say no, particularly if you are healthy, you have no other health conditions, you are underweight, then sure, bulk, get your mass. It's never too late. I've said in the past, I'm not going to bulk anymore. I don't think it's realistic for me to add more muscle at this stage of my life. I don't think it's possible really, but for you, sure. Why not? I think it's fine. I think it's okay. Just make sure you're getting your calories in, in a good way. You're sticking to predominantly whole foods, minimally processed and have a reasonable rate of progression. Okay. The final question will end with this. This is Faz. Have you ever gone over your competitive bodybuilding history in a video? I'd like to know what your experience was like competing in men's physique. I've not actually. So thank you for the question. It gives me a chance to speak about it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So just to give you a bit of background, I finished powerlifting in 2014 and I can remember the very session that I finished powerlifting. I used to lift with a crew, um, three or four of us guys, we used to lift together two or three times a week. And I specifically remember we would train all the lifts in one day. So squat, bench, and deadlift, like I've detailed in my eBooks, the tactician. So I remember it got to the squats and my knees felt, felt awful. And I went light and I told my buddy, Mark, I was like, I'm going to go light today. He's like, okay, fine. So next up was a bench press, started benching and my elbows felt terrible. And this had been going on for a while. I was just beaten up. The realization dawned on me, like I'm just really beaten up. Like I've got to change things. Everything was in pain. And that's what happens. I had a, a career of really pushing the limits. I trained through a lot of warning signs to tell me to stop. And I pushed and I got very strong, but it does take its toll on the body. There are better ways of doing it, but that session, I decided enough. And I said to Mark, look, Mark, I'm done. And he said, you're not going to deadlift. And I said to him, no, Mark, I'm done. And I walked off and I never lifted with them again. And that ended my powerlifting career after 14 years of being under the heavyweights, winning various regional competitions, getting to the nationals, even going to the Euros. I felt it was enough at the time. Yeah, I could have rehabbed. I could have got back on with things. I could have got back on the horse. But realistically speaking, I had reached such heady numbers. I knew I was on the way down. I was mid thirties. I had competed since I was 18, but I had a long time under the iron. I just didn't want it anymore. So I stopped it there. And then there was a period of about four years where I only coached. I started to get some coaching clients. I just coached them for free, no money at all. And it was just because they could see, I knew what I was doing. I was passionate about what I was doing. And so I coached them and it, we had a good time. And I loved coaching my clients, but it wasn't the same as competing myself. I always felt something was missing. I didn't feel that it was quite right to end things there. But at the same time, I also didn't want to do powerlifting again. I had a cupboard full of trophies and I had nothing left to prove. So in 2018, I made the decision to compete in bodybuilding. I wanted to do the men's physique category, 
mostly because I like the aesthetic. I enjoyed it. I also thought the conditioning requirements were slightly less than for full bodybuilding. That was a big factor because I wasn't confident about my ability to get really lean. My prep was six months in total. I lost something like, I think 50 pounds of fat altogether over six months, which was a lot. And the actual, the process was very gratifying. I remembered everything about competition again. I remembered why I liked competing so much. And I also realized it was never powerlifting. It was competition. While I do love powerlifting, what I love more is going head to head against someone, man to man, head to head and beating them. That's what I love. And so when I went into bodybuilding, it just felt right again. And it gave me that discipline. It gave me that goal to work for. I'm a better person when I compete in something. It made me make myself a priority in a way which is difficult to do. All of you people watching, man, woman, whoever you are, who have got a lot of responsibilities, perhaps a family, perhaps children, you'll know that in your mind, you're no longer a priority. You are secondary to your child, to your work, to everything else. And it comes to the end of the week and you think, oh, you know what? I should have done that better. I should have done that better. And it's always stuff about yourself. You never prioritize yourself. And as a result, you have mixed days, missed weeks, mixed months. And you're like, damn, I wish I'd put a bit more focus into that. But for that period of six months, I made myself a priority. And in doing so, it had a very strange effect on everything else because everything else went better as well. I realized that all that time spent on me doing more cardio, improving my diet, it made my work productivity better as well. It made me a better person. It made me a better partner. It made me a better coach. It just made everything better. And I realized what I loved about competition was that feeling of just having that sort of restructure and discipline about me, making myself a priority. My entire life has been spent in service of other people. I've been an educator my entire life. I've always either taught or I've coached. It's always been to facilitate other people's success or education. And for that six month period, I made myself a priority and it felt good. And it had the side effect of having a positive drip into other areas of my life too. So I really enjoyed the process. Now the actual day of the show, I loved it. It was great. People are very nervous about being on stage. I loved it. When I got on stage, <laughs> I just felt awesome. I had no hangups about being on stage at all. There was no embarrassment. There was no nervousness. I got on stage and I absolutely loved it. I put everything into that posing. I really enjoyed it. And I promised myself I would compete again. But uh, what inevitably happened was the, uh, the world events from uh, the previous few years, which interrupted that. And then I decided to pull back on my body weight a little bit, got a bit smaller and then my coaching picked up and well, the rest is history. It never happened again. So I'm not sure if I ever would. This year I'm going to be 42. Um, I still hold some decent size, but I am quite a lot more downsized from before. And I'm not sure I want to be that big anymore. People ask me all the time, you younger guys in the gym, are you going to compete again? One guy said to me last week, I feel like I've missed prime faz. <laughs> and I said to him, look, I've got a cupboard full of trophies. I have nothing left to prove. I've been doing this for what has been 22 years and it's your time now. You know, you need to go and do something. Leave me alone. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I ever will. Never say never. But at this point, my life is so busy with my clients, full time managing the business. And after a while, I think when you've done something for so long, you just end up losing the fire for it. And if it ever comes back, I will, but it's not something I'm going to force. I've got nothing left to prove at this stage. I've done it all. I'm happy with it. I would do it all again, for sure. And uh, for anyone who's thinking about competing, you should. It's a wonderful experience. If it's something that you want to do, it's a wonderful experience. And I really liked it. But yeah, that was my experience. Thank you for the question. That was nice to go down memory lane. So yeah, thank you for that. Take care, folks. I'll see you in the next one.